Hello everyone and welcome to the very first lecture of microprocessors and microcontrollers. From the course name itself, I believe it's pretty much evident that in this course we are going to learn about the microprocessors and the microcontrollers. And today we are in the session Introduction to Microprocessors. So without any further ado, let's get to learning. Coming to the topics that we are going to cover in this particular session, at first we will be briefly introduced to microprocessors. Thereafter, we will learn about the syllabus that we are going to follow in this particular subject. And finally, we will talk about the prerequisites and the target audience. So let's begin. We will start off with the brief introduction to microprocessors. Now here, we have got a modern day computer that is a desktop computer. Now can we identify the various components on the screen that we can see? Well, this is the VDU or the visual display unit, in other words, the monitor. Through this, we get to see the outputs on the screen. Underneath this, we have got the keyboard and the mouse. These are the input devices. Whereas, this particular one, that is the monitor, is an output device. Now, what about this big box? Well, although we call it CPU, that is a central processing unit, However, that we use in layman's term, this is actually the cabinet of the central processing unit. Let me clarify this. If we are talking about a unit, it shouldn't have various different components. However, we all know, if we go through this cabinet, there are several components. Now, let me walk you through them as well. If we open up this cabinet, the biggest component that we get to see is the motherboard. And to this motherboard, we have got connections of various different components as well, which reside inside the cabinet itself. Let's now talk about the various components which are connected to this motherboard. At first, we have got the main memory, which we call the RAMs. And these RAMs are connected to the motherboard using something called the RAM modules. As you can observe, these are positioned vertically. So when we will connect these ramps to these modules, they will also be connected vertically. Now, apart from the motherboard and the main or the primary memory, inside the cabinet, we also have the auxiliary memory or the secondary storage device. For this illustration, let's assume in our system, we have got the hard disk drive. Now, how the external storage device that is the hard disk drive is connected to the motherboard? Well, they are connected to the motherboard using SATA cables. This SATA cable at one end will be connected to the hard disk drive and on the other end, it will be connected to the SATA ports. Now, apart from these, we also have the power supply, which is more technically called SMPS or switching mode or switch mode power supply. Now, the main purpose of this SMPS is to obtain a controlled direct current supply which will help in powering all these components. Now let's get into the functionalities. We store our data more permanently inside the secondary auxiliary storage. And when we want to run our applications, we store the applications temporarily on the main memory. Now the question is, which unit actually helps us execute the instructions within the applications? And the answer to that is the processor. Now, where is the processor in this entire illustration? Well, it is underneath this heat sink. So, this is the central processing unit or CPU. However, engineers nowadays preferably call it the microprocessing unit or the microprocessors. And the reason for that is, over the times, that is through the various generation of computers, the size of the processor got decreased drastically. Now, let me tell you why this was hiding underneath the heat sink. Well, during execution, the microprocessor gets very heated. So, in order to keep it cool, we need the heat sink. Now, this is a very detailed view of the components within the computer. Let's use a simple view in order to understand the organization even better. As you can see, we have got three different components and a system bus. Starting off with the first one, there is the IO peripherals. These are all the input-output devices put together. Coming up next, we have got the memory. 
Now, which memory we are talking about with the help of this depiction? Well, this is the main memory. Now, you might be wondering what happened to the auxiliary or the secondary storage. Well, auxiliary storages fall under these IO peripherals as well. Because the way input output devices are interfaced with the system, that is our computer system, is the same way the auxiliary storages are also interfaced. Up next, you can see this big unit. It has got a few sections. Let me go through them. One, the registers. Thereafter, we have the arithmetic and logic unit, then the timing and control unit, and this interface section. Well, this is the microprocessor itself. Now, notice this block diagram a bit carefully. The purpose of the system bus is to connect all these components together. So, we can relate to the system bus the purpose of motherboard. Because that too was connecting all the different components to the processor itself. Let's now talk about the microprocessor in a bit more details. Now, the microprocessors are also known as MUP. Let me explain what it means. Mu here stands for micro, and P represents the processor. Now, why mu is representing micro? If you think about it, when we talk about different units of time, we call them seconds, milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, and so on. And there also, we denote micro using the symbol mu. And the reason we are calling it microprocessor, because over the time, the size of the processing unit got reduced, and thus the name microprocessor. Also remember, micro signifies 10 raised to the power minus 6. Well, that doesn't have any significance in this particular discussion. Here, just because of its reduced size, we call the processors nowadays the microprocessors. Now, when we were identifying the various component, we learned that this sees the microprocessor. And in the simplified view, we saw this particular block diagram. Well, as you can see, it has got various sections. Let me explain what are these one by one. At first, we have got the registers where we can store data and instructions temporarily. Try to understand this. When an application is being run, the instructions written in that application are to be fetched and decoded by the microprocessor. There, the registers help us. The instructions are stored in some of the registers and thereafter they are decoded. Also, the registers come handy when we operate on the data. Basically, from the memory, we bring in the data and place them inside the registers and the operations which we are supposed to perform on that data are taken care of by this unit which we call the arithmetic and logic unit. Coming to the next section, it is named as Timing and Control Unit. This is a very interesting section. Let me explain how it works. We all know when an application is being run, the instructions within that application are to be executed in a particular sequence. So, which instruction is to be executed after which one is taken care of by the timing unit. And the required components which are needed to execute those particular instructions are activated using the control unit. Finally, we have got this interface section. This helps the microprocessor to interface with all the different components of the computer system. So, all these are placed on a single chip. And that chip we call the microprocessor or popularly known as MUP. So, that was the brief introduction to microprocessors. Let's now talk about the syllabus that we are going to follow in this particular course. Now, coming to the syllabus, in this subject, we will have 10 different chapters. The first one we are naming as Introduction to Microprocessors. In this chapter, we will mainly talk about the different generations of computers and the advent of the microprocessors. Also, we will learn about the various number representations which will help us understand the assembly language programs in a better way. Coming up next, we have got the chapter 2 which we are naming as Fundamentals of 8085 Microprocessor. Well, in this particular course, we will be mainly focusing on the 8085 Microprocessor 
and in this chapter we will basically learn about the organization of the 8085 microprocessor additionally we will also talk about the various registers within 8085 microprocessor now the third chapter we will name as instructions of 8085 microprocessor part 1 now in this chapter we will mainly talk about the classification of 8085 instructions and we will elaborate on the data transfer group of instructions the arithmetic group of instructions and the logical group of instructions with meaningful examples we will also cover the various addressing modes of 8085 microprocessor in this particular chapter coming to the next chapter which we are naming as instructions of 8085 microprocessor part 2 here we will mainly focus on the stack and branch group of instructions respectively we will also understand them with suitable examples the next chapter that is chapter 5 we named it as chip selection and addressing of IO ports now in the beginning of this chapter there is chip selection we will talk about the concept of chip selection with the use of 74138 to generate chip select logic in the later part of this chapter there is addressing of IO ports here we will discuss the need of IO ports and also we will compare the concepts of IO mapped IO with memory mapped IO with respect to 8085 microprocessor. Coming to the next chapter, that is chapter 6, we are naming it as the architecture of 8085 microprocessor. Now in this chapter, we will furnish a detailed architecture of 8085 microprocessor. And we will also learn about the various machine cycles needed for executing a variety of instructions provided by 8085 microprocessor. Coming up next, there is a chapter 7. We are naming it as Assembly Languages Programs Part 1. Now in this chapter, at first, we will be introduced to the typical 8085 microprocessor kit. And we will also talk about the simple assembly language programs that are executed on a microprocessor kit. The next chapter, that is chapter 8, we will name it as Assembly Language Programs Part 2. Here, we are mainly going to talk about additional assembly language programs such as linear search, conversion from binary to ASCII, ASCII to binary, some complex assembly language programs like bubble sort, selection sort, etc. By the end of this chapter, we will have achieved a significant knowledge of assembly language programs. Coming up next, that is the chapter 9. Here we will talk about the programmable and non-programmable IO ports. Now in this chapter, at first we will talk about the interrupts in 8085. Thereafter, we will learn about the non-programmable I.O. port, that is 8212. And by the end of it, we will learn about 8255 programmable peripheral interface chip. Now comes the final chapter, that is chapter 10. We are naming it as support chips of 8085 microprocessor. Now, this is a chapter which is going to be a very interesting one. Here, we will learn about the different support chips starting off with interfacing the I.O. devices. We will learn about the Intel's 8259 programmable interrupt controller, Intel's 8257 programmable DMA controller. Along with this, we will also learn about 8253 programmable interval timer, which is used for 8085 microprocessors. Then we will study the universal synchronous asynchronous receiver transmitter, that is Intel's 8251, which is also known as user. And by the end of this chapter, we will mainly focus on the 8051 microcontroller. So in our syllabus, we are going to have 10 different chapters. So that is going to be our syllabus, which we are going to follow in this course. Let's now talk about the prerequisites and the target audience. Now coming to the prerequisite, since microprocessor is an advanced course, Therefore, we will need the basic knowledge of digital logic design and computer organization and architecture. However, when we will need to revisit those concepts from these two courses, I promise to be as detailed as possible. Let's now talk about the target audience, that is, keeping whom in mind the course has been designed. 
First of all, this course has mainly been designed keeping college and university scholars in mind who have microprocessors and microcontrollers in their curriculum. Additionally, any competitive exam aspirants can refer to the lectures. Competitive exams like GET, NET, NIELIT, etc. requires comprehensive understanding of the core concepts in order to crack them. Finally, any microprocessor and microcontroller enthusiast who wants to have a quick overview of the topics can refer to the lectures. So these were the topics that we were supposed to cover in this session. We were briefly introduced to the microprocessors. We also talked about the syllabus. And finally, we also talked about the prerequisites, that is the basic knowledge of digital logic design and computer organization and architecture. Also, the target audience. Alright people, that will be all for this session. In the next session, we will be introduced to microcontrollers. So I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you all for watching.